welcome one more time to our session wearable robotics and micro robotics. Our first speaker for today is Professor Nestor Perez. He is a professor at the University of Southern California, and he will share his research with us about the challenging path to creating a fully autonomous and controllable micro robots. Uh, the floor is yours, Professor Perez. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, and as I stated in my title today, I'm going to talk mostly about the challenging path to creating fully autonomous and controllable micro robots. So let's talk about micro robots. So my vision and dream, uh, which is the shared dream uh, by the members of my lab, uh, most micro roboticists in the, on the planet, is the creation of uh, machines capable of replicating some of the capabilities observed in biological systems, such as bees, butterflies, moths, um, and beetles. Right, these animals serve as inspiration uh, for the development of new robots because uh, they are awesome in every aspect, right? Including power conversion, actuation, sensing, and control. So beyond the dream, why would we like to develop micro robots and in general advance the field of micro robotics? Well, because there are numerous uh, direct potential applications such as uh, search and rescue, agricultural pollination, ge geographical survey, right, surveillance, environmental monitoring, and indirect applications that can emerge uh, from the advancement of micro robotics, such as the development of new medical devices, the development of new tools for minimal invasive medicine, and the development of new tools for high precision micro manufacturing. So generally speaking, I uh, look at nature for inspiration and therefore, it is important to briefly discuss uh, what is my approach to biological inspired engineering. So in my view, biological machines inform, inform us about what is feasible, right? So under this idea, right, in agreement with this idea, uh, in the biological inspired approach, features uh, purely biologic, uh, with purely biological function should not be uh, mimicked, right? So the idea is that we as, a, as engineers and designers have to be extremely careful because evolution uh, works as a tinker under multiple constraints. And therefore, in principle, nature designs are not necessarily optimal, right? So having said that, it's important to acknowledge that biological machines, in particular insects, right, still are way better uh, our micro robots in almost every aspect. So today I will discuss, I will present three robots that were developed in my lab that represent, for different reasons, a breakthrough from the autonomous perspective. So the first is B+, which is a 95 milligram flying robot, which is the first and only artificial insect actuated by four wings driven by four different independent actuators, right? So, and during the presentation of B+, I will discuss some important topics relating to robotic design and control. So in a specific, I will to explain how we use robotic design to solve control problems, right? So which breaks with the traditional paradigm of first designing robots and after finding controllers for them, right? So here, there is an iterative process in which design helps to solve the control problem. So the second is Robido, uh, which is an 88 milligram autonomous scrolling robot, which is driven by a catalytic artificial muscle. So this artificial muscle combines the high work densities of chain memory alloys with the capability of using high energy density sources of energy such as methanol, butane, and propane. And during the presentation of Robido, we'll discuss some important topics relating to energy, right? And I'm going to explain why energy actually is the bottleneck to advance uh, micro robotics, uh, autonomy in micro robotics. And finally, I'm going to talk about a small bug, which is a 30 milligram crawling robot, which is driven by a six milligram SMA based a uh, high frequency uh, uh, micro actuator. And during my presentation, a small book, I will explain uh, why the combination of technologies behind Robido and a small book represent a path to creating the first fully autonomous subgram flying, flying artificial uh, insects. So here is uh, B plus, right? So in my biased opinion, B plus represents a major uh, breakthrough with respect to previous uh, two wing prototypes, uh, most of them published in 2013, because among other things, a uh, long standing control problem was solved uh, by a robotic design, right? So in a specific, uh, the geodegree of freedom of B plus 
can be controlled using a method that we call the inclined stroke plane method. So the leaf to weight ratio of the newest version of E plus is about three uh, when flapping at 150 hertz, while that of the best uh, previous two wind prototypes is about 1.8. Uh, despite having four wings, which are driven by four independent actuators, the whole robot weighs only 95 milligrams, right? And the creation of Plus was made possible by the invention of a new type of uni unimorph piezoelectric actuator, what by itself is a, is a breakthrough. So to put in context the significance of this new robot, uh, so we need to look at a little bit of uh, history and evolution of flying artificial insects. Right, so the first uh, functional insect scale flapping wing machine was the Harvard Fly that was published in 2008. Uh, this is a 60 milligram two wing robot that was demonstrated to generate lift forces large enough to compensate gravity for some seconds. Right, so then in 2011, uh, after an exciting year of work as a postdoc at Harvard, uh, we, so uh, I work, you know, I, I, lead, I led that team. So we uh, uh, published a paper that introduced Superfly, which is this robot here, uh, which is the first to win robot robust enough to be controlled by modulating the speed of flapping, right? Also this paper presented the first controlled vertical fly of a robot of this type. Then in 2012, uh, first year PhD student at Harvard, Kevin Ma, developed uh, the first two wing, two actuator robot based on ideas from David Doman from the Air Force Lab. So this prototype enabled the design and implementation of several controllers for unconstrained flight. So this movie here uh, shows an experiment published in one of my papers in 2000, from 2013. Then there was silence, right? And um, for many years, no significant progress was reported. Uh, specifically, the lift to weight ratios remain about 1.5 and, and the long standing control problem I already mentioned, uh, produced by the inability to produce sufficient yaw torque uh, for effective control could not be solved. So that was a very tough problem. And then in 2019, finally, progress was reported. So from the Harvard lab, they produced this uh, robot called the RoboV X-Wing, which increased the lift to weight ratio up to three but because it's driven by two actuators only, right? And each lateral pair of wind is fixed, this robot is not controllable, right? So I haven't seen any control experiment. So there are some experiments in which, which they show going up for some seconds, but I, it, it's clearly that you cannot control this robot. And then also in 2014, uh, 19, uh, Sawyer Fuller from University of Washington uh, published this robot called Four Wings. Uh, which increased the lift to weight ratio up to three, and in theory is fully controllable. However, I haven't seen experiments showing that actually the yaw degree of freedom can be uh, controlled in experiments. Uh, it has a large envelope, right? Uh, no longer looks like, uh, like, uh, like an insect. And actually it's pretty heavy for, for a robot of this type, right? So it's 143 milligrams. And um, finally, uh, 2019, uh, my PhD students and I published B plus, as I mentioned before, right? We increased the lift to weight ratio up to three. And the cool thing about this is that it's fully controllable. And for the first time, right? We have a system that can, uh, for which we can control the geodegree of freedom. So we can implement aerobatic maneuvers and other maneuvers that before we couldn't, we couldn't implement because the previous robots were not uh, controllable. And the cool thing is, as I mentioned before, it weighs only 95 milligrams and the, and, and the whole volume is very similar to that of the Superfly. So uh, the main characteristic of the B+, right, is that it's driven by two pairs of twin unimorph piezoelectric actuators. So these actuators are by themselves an important innovation and is what made possible the development of this new robot. Right, and in this case, uh, wind pitching is produced uh, passively uh, using elastic hinges and the interaction of the winds with the surrounding uh, fluid, right? And thrust is modulated by varying the amplitude and or frequency of flapping, right? The roll degree of freedom is produced by flapping asymmetrically with respect to the roll axis, right? This is the roll axis. 
Uh, the pitch degree of freon of the body is controlled by flapping asymmetrically with respect to the pitch axis, which is this one here. Uh, and a major innovation in the aerodynamic of B plus, uh, it and it was and is the is the key element to solve this long-standing control problem that I mentioned before, is that we have a new design in which the winds are installed with an inclined plane, so we can effectively control the jaw degree of freedom, right? And all that was enabled by these new actuators, by the new design uh, that allow us to install the winds right in, with this inclination and generate uh, effective jaw torques. So how does the inclined stroke plane strategy works for control? So each of the four wind is flapped independently by an un and unimorph piezoelectric actuators uh, shown here, right? So as mentioned before, the flapping pattern on the left is used to modulate the generation of pitch torques. And this uh, pattern is used to modulate roll. But now because we have the, this new aerodynamic design, this new robotic design, right? So if we install the winds, by installing the winds with this inclined plane with respect to this B1, B2 axis, we can generate effective uh, yaw torque here that allow us to control the, the yaw degree of freedom. So uh, previous to this design, right, there, there, there was this idea that you can use a thing called a split cycling, but because of the narrow bandwidth of the actuators, right, narrow bandwidth in this context, right, uh, that method, it, it was theoretically possible, but in practice uh, never really worked. Right, so how do we design and fabricate micro robots in general? I'm going to deviate a little bit here so you can understand how, uh, you know, students and other people that are not familiar with this uh, understand how we uh, build, design and build this robot. So in general, we start with a basic understanding about how a robot is going to physically interact with the environment. So in my experience, the best way to acquire this basic uh, physical understanding is to perform experiments and collect data. So for, uh, for example, we flap single wings and measure the resulting forces in the case of flying robots. And we measure static and dynamic friction, right, and friction coefficients uh, for crawling robots, right? So in general, we simultaneously design the robotics uh, system and the fabrication process, right? So when we design, we think about control and all these things, but also we have to design the fabrication process because we start everything from scratch. So in general, uh, we design and fabricate two, two D parts that are folded and assembled with other two D parts to create three D components. Right. So in more detail, uh, the fabrication process starts with conceptualization and the generation of you know CAD designs like these. So then, flat pieces of different materials are pre laser cut, as shown in this movie. Uh, align and stack uh, as a step prior to the application of heat and pressure according to secret lab uh, patterns, right? In order to create fissure and pattern uh, multi-material laminates that then are release cut with the components. For example, these components here are piezoelectric uh, actuators. So that's after this brief descri description, but I can explain why the actuators developed to drive B plus represent an important innovation in terms of actuation, uh, design, and microfabrication. So, in this slide, the upper illustrations, right? The upper illustration uh, show how a pair of twin unimorph actuators through two independent transmissions drive two winds at each side of the B1, B3 plane. B1, B3 plane is this here, right? So, the bottom cartoon shows the layers of materials, right? The layers of materials used to form the stack uh, for lamination. So here PCT, which is shown in blue, is the exact excitable piezoelectric material. So, and also showing the bottom, middle and bottom right, right? So the unimorph actuators are fabricated, right? Fabricated, installed and excited, right? Electrically excited as twins, right? So key fabrication achievements here in this case are uh, the resulting mechanical robustness and the geometrical accuracy, which is very important at this scale, right? Uh, line is an extremely small volume of the twin actuators. So in this case, right, it's extremely difficult in general, right, to create adhesion between the layers of, of the materials, right? And also it's important to mention that the whole, each actuator weighs only uh, 14 milligrams. So in the case of B plus, Right, uh, 
And all the flying machines I know, the open loop system is non-linear non and is unstable. Therefore, we perform grounding tests like the one shown here, right? For the purpose of uh, functionality verification and system identification. And system identification is very important because that allows us to get the, the dynamics to design controllers, right? So in this video, uh, we can clearly see how during a flapping cycle, the winds pass the pitch as the result of the interaction, the interaction with the surrounding fluid, right? So the pitching you see here is, is a, a, a structure, a structure, fluid in a structure interaction process, right? And as seen in this table, right? Uh, the physical parameters uh, measured figures of medidit for for this robot show that this is the best robot of this type ever developed. So how do you measure forces? And here is just an example. Unfortunately, uh, there are no commercially available sen force sensors. Uh, this is scale. Uh, so for this reason, we design and build our own sensor using basic beam theory, for example. And in this, and the, and this example shown here, uh, uh, we map the deflection of a double cantilever beam into a force signal. So during the design process of the sensor, we use analysis and simulations. Then, uh, during, uh, then after fabrication, we use system identification and calibration, right? So, and in general for system identification and characterization purposes, we measure uh, the forces generated by a flapping system. So we want to prescribe the flapping motion. So we implement simple controllers to prescribe the motions, right? So we can have uh, comparison for different frequencies and amplitudes and so forth, right? And some important thing that all the process allow us, allow us to see is that, <coughs> is that uh, for example, instantaneous forces, right? Uh, produced during an, a cycle oscillate, right? So things that from a control perspective, you have to think is that uh, in, in reality, the forces produced oscillate, right? But what allows us a robot to fly is, or an insect to fly is, the, is that the average uh, force is positive. And then you do see insects or robots typically oscillating when they're flying is because the dynamics of the system functions as a low pass filter that filter out the high frequencies, right? So <clears throat> something uh, impossible to do before VPLAS was an open loop ground and test like this one. Uh, but the fabrication accuracy we achieved was so great that uh, for the first time we were able to run, uh, when we say we, the whole community, micro robotics community, for the same time we were able to run uh, open loop experiment like this one, right? So before that, the, the measuring of forces was very important. Now it has become less important because we can, uh, in this system, particular design, we can perform things like this one. Okay, so as I already mentioned today, uh, before talking about controller synthesis, I will, uh, we need to explain uh, at a very basic level how our dynamics forces are generated, right? So I'm gonna go very fast here. So for that purpose, we can have an explanation using a experimental informed quasi steady model, right? So, so for one period, uh, the average least force generated can be modeled in this way, in which this uh, C1 of alpha bar, right, is a lump, uh, coefficient that depends on the mean angle of attack, right? The mean angle of attack of a cycle. This new here is the frequency and this uh, five zero is the end-to-end -end magnitude of flapping, right? And S is the, is the area of the wind. And we can find similar models uh, for the drag force acting on a wind, but from a control perspective, from a dynamics and control and design perspective, the important thing to notice right, is that by varying the frequency and or the, the amplitude, right, we can uh, modulate the forces acting on a wind uh, such that we can implement controllers, right, design controllers uh, or design controller strategies and so forth, right, and in the particular case of how do we control now with this new design, the degree of freedom, you can think again of a quasi steady model and uh, notice that because the winds are, if the winds, if, if the design allow us to install the wind with, a, with, with an inclined plane, right, with respect to this P1, B2 plane, which is perpendicular to this longitudinal axis, right? So we can effectively generate torques here that allow us to control the geodegree of freedom and that allow us to do other things. 
So let's put in everything together. We arrive to a model, uh, we can use a simple model like this in which, right, this is the dynamics of the position, uh, dynamics of the system, this is the <coughs> angular velocity dynamics, and this is the added dynamics and, the, and for which we use uh, quaternions, right? And, and so Q is the quaternion that describes the attitude of the robot relative to the inertial frame. Um, P here, right, is defined uh, in terms of the uh, angular velocity, right? And the asterisk here is the standard uh, quaternion multiplication. So I have a whole explanation about that that I'm going to skip because, because of time. So I'm gonna jump into the, the actuators. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about actuators, but now from the, from the control perspective, not from the fabrication perspective. So each unimorph actuator is excited uh, with a signal with this form. For reasons that I don't have time to explain, this voltage has to remain positive, right? So we have this variable that essentially keeps the voltage positive. And for control purposes, we vary this amplitude here, uh, bi, and also this delta i if, if necessary. Right, so from that, I'm borrowing from the literature in quadrotors, right? So we can find, identify in experimentally, right? A mapping between the excitation of the actuators to the generalized forces acting on the robot, which in this case, we have four, which is the total thrust force produced by, by the four winds and the torques acting on the body, right? That we call type one, type two, and type three. So for flight controller synthesis, right? And this is a general, I, I, want, uh, I need to go very fast and we are gonna explain a super simple case, right? So for flight uh, controller synthesis, right? So uh, we use uh, a, a basic control structure like this one. So in this framework, different control algorithms can be designed, right? Uh, but a key element here is that because the new aerodynamic design for the first time, uh, we can use as reference, right? The, 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 the yaw angle, okay? So using the flapping patterns in the top illustrations here, right, we can generate uh, the force magnitude F and the three torques uh, about the pitch roll and yaw axis, right? Something important to see here is that uh, B, the, this robot B plus cannot directly generate forces along the pitch, right, and the roll axis. Right, so, so it can only generate thrust force along, along the, the yaw axis, right? So we cannot generate a thrust force along this axis or this axis, right? So only around this axis. So consistently to do position control, the idea is to use the attitude, uh, an attitude control to, to point uh, the generated thrust force along a required direction in order to reach a point in space, right? So accordingly, we have an inner controller, this one here, uh, that receives inputs as inputs, uh, the reference, uh, a reference uh, which is generated by the position controller and the measure attitude that is given by this quaternion. And we have an outer controller, right? That controls position, right? Using the, as always, right? The, the error plus the uh, desire, uh, your, your angle, then again, it's only possible now because of the new robotic designs that we have. Okay, so regardless of, the, of, of, of what are the specific algorithms that we're going to, we're going to design, uh, right? In the synthesis and implementation of the inner attitude controllers, right? We need to define uh, desired dynamics. So we define a desired dynamics here again is defined uh, using quaternions, right? So this quaternion QD, it represents the desired attitude of the flyer during flight. And this PD is defined in terms of this omega D hat here, which denotes the desired angular velocity express and the desired frame of reference, right? With whose orientation coincides exactly with the with that of QD. And then uh, if you play with the quaternions or you read papers or books, you can find out that the error right, between the desire and measure attitude uh, is given by this expression here, right? Uh, in which if you know quaternions, right? So this is uh, an scalar and this is, is a vector, right? And then we can uh, 
uh, propose right a simple or, or not necessarily a simple, but the first thing that came to mind is to propose a simple uh, control uh, way uh, to generate uh, the torque according to a control law, law like this. Okay, so, and then how do we do uh, position control? Uh, so the first thing we do is to, is to uh, uh, also using a control law is to generate a desired force that is gonna point us to the right direction, right? And then uh, we compute the magnitude of that. And then using uh, the, our desired jaw angle so we can determine the required orientation for this four in order to reach a point. So that is, is in general, right? So if we go along with this very simple first uh, control structure that we propose, right? So we can achieve, we can do control like this, right? Uh, in this case, we are controlling the altitude and attitude, right? Uh, and that was the first prototype. And this is the second prototype we designed uh, and, and okay, and the results are okay. So then if you look at the data, you see that, oh, this works more or less okay, right? So we try to follow the altitude reference and keep more or less at zero, the Euler angles. And then if you are controlling position, you see that this work okay, right? But just work okay. So what we can do next, right? So we can have the same structure, right? But now we can use, uh, uh, so, so now if we want to optimize, right, performance or we want to enforce uh, stability, what, what, what can we do? And the answer, right, is just to use more linear and nonlinear control theory, right? Specifically, we can use all those uh, Lyapunov theorems and so forth. Uh, and, and when we pick, right, the, the controller structure here, we can, uh, choose the parameters and the structure of the controller and the parameters of the controller such that we can ensure stability and also we can define optimization progress for performance and so forth. And the way to, to, to connect both controllers is the same way than before, right? So the attitude controller receives as a reference, right? Uh, this quaternion that is produced by the position controller according to this method that I already explained. So for example, if we're gonna use Lyapunov, we can uh, now choose uh, a, a way to generate the, the torque, uh, the control torque here in a smarter way that is gonna allow us to find, uh, to prove, to enforce uh, the stability of the closed loop system, of the fixed point of the, of the closed loop system, right? So if, if, we, if we adopt that structure, uh, the state space representation of the attitude closed loop dynamic is given uh, by this uh, by this system here, right? So this system, uh, the the, you can prove that the function here on the right side is local ellipses and, and that the system has two equilibrium points, right? QE asterisk one zero 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 uh, with this uh, angular error. <laughs> Uh, that the seconds correspond, the second fixed point correspond to this minus zero zero with the same angular error. And the reason for this is because there is an ambiguity uh, in the when you use quaternions, there is an ambiguity in the representation of your system. But in this case, it's not a problem. So we can. Uh, others, uh, we can look at the, we can uh, find parameters, right, to enforce that the, this, uh, this uh, fixed point is asymptotically stable, right, and to do that, uh, we use just Lyapunov direct method with the Lassalle invariance principle, right, so obviously I'm going to go very fast here because this is, you know, almost everybody knows this. So, so we can have a proposition, right, so if we pick the, in this case, the, the right case, uh, say to be constant, positive, definite, right? So we can we can show, right? So we just by picking these two, the by choosing this uh, uh, this game in this way, uh, we can show that this uh, uh, fixed point, close to the fixed point, is going to be asymptotically stable. And the sketch of the proof that the key is just to choose uh, these uh, function as your level of function, and then you can use the theorem. Right, so, so a couple of remarks here. So remark one, remember that tau is have this form, 
right? Remark two is that uh, the equilibrium point corresponding to minus one is unstable. Uh, so every other state will converge to, to, this, to this fixed point, which is the asymptotic stable. All right, so, so then remember we have the combination of these uh, inner uh, controller in the outer controller, the outer controller, we just can choose uh, uh, PID like a structure. So, you know, I, I, everybody can do the analysis and arrive to a uh, condition for stability given in terms of LMIs that I'm going to skip here because, you know, again, everybody can do it. Um, and again, this is just an example. So what is the key element here? The key element is that remember in order to solve this problem, it wasn't just about uh, finding a nice controller and then using theorems, ensuring that the whole thing is going to be, the, the, the fixed points, the closed loop fixed points are gonna be stable. So we use a robotic design. Remember that the whole thing depends on the ability for us to generate the right torques in a way prescribe the desire uh, your angle of the system, right? That is a key element to do this, right? So it's a combination of robotic design uh, with, uh, with control. Okay, so how does all that work? So we obviously, after that, we can enforce stability and also we can do optimization and all those things. So everything works way better, right? So the control errors now are very small. Uh, not only that, uh, as I told you before, this, with this new design, oh, with this new design, uh, we can effectively control the geodegree of freedom. And for example, we can track uh, your angles with huge amplitudes, like the one shown here. So actually, it's hard to see here because you have to look at the small markers. But actually, we are following uh, uh, your reference with these huge amplitudes, right? So for the first time you know, in human history, someone was able to do that. So now we're able actually to, to do this. And obviously that allow us to, to do like things like uh, do, you know, uh, aerobatic or semi-aerobatic maneuvers, right? And again, because of time, I'm gonna go fast here. So, but we can, for example, follow uh, uh, loops with this uh, form and so forth. Okay, so I want to go fast here because there are a couple of important things that I have to mention. So, so then after all these results, right, uh, we, uh, uh, can we create a full autonomous uh, B plus? So from the actuation perspective, the answer is yes. From the control perspective, uh, the answer is yes, as I showed you before. From the sensing perspective, I'm going to show you a, a slide, the next slide, and we can say yes. From the computation from real time control implementation, the answer is yes. So what about energy and power? And unfortunately the answer is no. Okay, so in this case, uh, control sensing, all those things are difficult problems, but I don't want to uh, say that those problems are easy, are difficult problems, but are super feasible with the knowledge and with the technology we have. So the big bottleneck here actually is power uh, and energy. Right, so, so for example, I'm going to provide a little bit of evidence for, for, for the sensors and for the computation capabilities. So now, for example, you can buy sensor like this MAU here, which weighs only 13 milligrams and the, the energy and power requirements are super reasonable and the same for microcontrollers, right? So it's just some other, and in the lab, we are programming using this sensor and we are programming microcontrollers now and we are making, uh, uh, you know, crawling autonomous robots and all that is not an issue. So the big issue here is power. Uh, to put this in context, and, and again, uh, the, the, the issue here is that the energy density of batteries is very low, right? Uh, that means that if you, if, you try, if, if, you do, if you do the math and you say how much time I can, for example, fly using a battery, you are gonna find out that it's gonna be uh, some seconds, right? But the main issue, however, is that the power density of batteries, so that is how fast you can release energy, uh, is very low, right? So if you give yourself some numbers, you say, okay, if I use a big battery, right, uh, for, for this context, right? So I can, I can get like 15 uh, milliwatts, right? But if you do 
an optimistic estimation of how much power you need for a robot like B plus, you are you are going to require 150 uh, milli uh, milliwatts, right? So there is this huge gap here because the batteries, the energy density of batteries is extremely extremely low. So what can we do, right? So we can wait for better batteries, and that's what some people have been doing for 30 years. So we can design robots that are aerodynamically more efficient. Uh, for example, Butterfly Inspire uh, are more efficient from the energy perspective than the Inspire system. However, you can, gain, you can do this, you, you are gonna gain, you know, uh, you can improve things by a factor of three or four, right? But it's not gonna solve the problem, right? So the other, the other answer you can have is that, okay, you can keep the robots tether, for example, using uh, electromagnetic fields. So you can think of a big robot that provides the energy to a magnetic field and the robots can function semi-autonomously, tether electromagnetically. Or the next things that you can do, and it was just my approach, is to, generate, is to create new actuation technologies uh, that don't depend on batteries. Right, and that's the motivation for the creation of Robito, right? So Robito uh, has become a minor celebrity among other micro robots. And Robito, the reason for that is Robito is driven by a catalytic muscle. So in specific, we use a controlled catalytic combustion to thermal excite an SMA wire. Uh, so this is a proof of concept. So the final objective is the creation of a fully autonomous butterfly inspired flying uh, subgram micro robot, right? So Robido uh, weighs 88 milligrams, right? So that makes it by a factor of 10, by a factor of 10, the lightest crawling robot uh, capable of sustained autonomous operation, okay? So, so, so we are not using batteries, it's completely autonomous. And the next, uh, the second best from the weight perspective, autonomous robots weigh one, one gram. So Robido is by a, for more than a factor of 10, light, uh, uh, lighter than the next best one in terms of autonomy. Okay, so what was the idea here? Uh, the key elements behind the actuator technology is that we combine the high word densities of SMH materials were with the ability of using uh, energy dense uh, sources of power uh, this, uh, in this case, we use methanol, but we also can use propane or butane, right? So, and the, the, the key element is that we use uh, uh, chemical reactions to generate the heat to excite SMA materials, SMA materials, right? And uh, as probably you know, SMA materials, you can start at a Martin size, typically at room temperature, you can have the material in a Martin size state. Then if you apply heat, the material goes into an austenized state. So, so you stay elongated when you apply heat, it contracts, right? And after it's cooled down, it comes back to a uh, Martin size state. But this Martin size state here is called uh, D twin, right? And this is called twin. So you, if you use the stress, you can D twin. So you can complete an actual cycle, right? So then it becomes a control problem in the sense that how, how do you control the chemical reaction to generate this cycle, right, uh, to produce actuation. So you have the combination of two highly nonlinear uh, processes, right, in which you have the dynamics of the SMA material and you have the, the combustion that, that gives you this heat, heat cycle. So in order to find the models and to design controllers and all that, uh, I use big, uh, you know, experimental setups like the ones uh, shown here. So we, we can measure the outputs and we can prescribe the inputs. And in particular, we're interested, we were interested in using and having temperature one of the input, right? Because when you use combustion and chemical reactions instead of electricity, which is the traditional way to excite SMS, right? You want to not to use electricity, a current as your, as your control signal, you want to use temperature, right? Because you are controlling we, want to we wanted to control the chemical reaction on the surface of the material, of the artificial muscle, right? So, so we do, we, my approach is to use system identification to find models, right? So one, 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 way, to, one way to model those systems is using uh, page, the page set method, right? So I'm not going to go into details, right? But the important thing is that the inputs, right, is 
is a stress and temperature and your output is a strain, right? It's the formation of the, of the, of the muscle, right? So in, in our case then, right? So we want control, as I, as I explained before, we want to control a chemical reaction, right? On, on the surface and, 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 and then understanding the dynamics right of the SMA system, uh, we want to operate along a smart uh, trajectory, right? So there are several things here, right? So we invented these new uh, muscles, right? Which have a core of nitinone, right? Which is an SMA material and a cipher of platinum that acts as the catalyst, right? And then combining the knowledge from using system identification of these two systems, right? Like the SMA dynamics, and the combustion dynamics, we were able to control this uh, this process, right? Okay, now I have to go fast. Uh, obviously, right. So uh, the first experiments where we use digital controllers, and we have a big experimental setup. And we show the people, we told the people, right? Oh, we can do this. Uh, we can control the chemical reactions on the surfaces, and we can do this, right? But then, you know. The, the big problem was, okay, you are using computers that are super big. Uh, we're using all these sensors and all these actuators. How are you gonna go down from having a system that weighs probably, you know, a thousand kilos into a micro robot, right? So many people were skeptical saying, yeah, you can, I have seen similar things before. That was the answer. People, people play with this system, but they need a huge computer to do the control, right? So the answer, right? So he was using a big computer to do the control. Right, so here we are controlling what you see here is the control uh, chemical reaction on the surface of the muscle. So the answer was to use uh, mechanical controllers, right, to solve the problem. Right, so 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 then uh, remember, Robido, the whole robot it's is only 88 milligram, right? And what we did is was to using uh, mechanical controllers and everything. The sensor is mechanical. Everything is mechanical, right? So, so, so we were able to do the same control of the chemical reaction using mechanical elements, right? And I remember again, everything is only, the whole system is only 88 milligrams. All right, I don't have time to go into the details because I'm running out of time here. Uh, but the main point here is that we use uh, system identification, nonlinear modeling, all these things to gather the information. But after we, trans we translated all that information into uh, robotic designs, that weighs only 88 milligrams. Okay, okay. So as you, uh, some of you probably saw, uh, uh, so so Robito right? So works completely uh, autonomously, right? So again, the is using we are using control chemical reactions on the surface of this artificial muscle, right? Um, from many metrics. Uh, again, it's the smallest and lightest autonomous robot ever developed, right? Um, from many perspectives, is the best crawling robot uh, uh, this scale ever developed. But uh, you know, you know what you're thinking. It still is kind of slow, right? So yes, it's kind of slow. So can we go faster? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we can go faster, right? And uh, I seen I completely run out of time. So I seen I I seen I have to grab it here. So, so the answer is that yes, we can go faster, and so we can combine uh, the same technology used uh, to create Robido from the actuator perspective. So we can combine the 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 we can we can combine the ability to create very fast uh, SMA SMA based actuators with catalytic combustion with chemical reactions, right? But using other fuels other than methanol to make these things uh, faster. Right, uh, my claim. So this is so obviously this is a, an, an experiment in laboratory conditions, right? So, but my claim is that um, very soon is going to allow us to have, for the first time, completely autonomous uh, uh, flying robots that are driven not by batteries, but driven by chemical reactions, right? And the key element, right, is that the sources of energy here are highly dense. Right, are significantly better than batteries. There are other problems, right? I don't have time to explain here, but this is this, this is the path. All right, so I, uh, so this is uh, was my research group like a year and a half ago. So five of these guys already graduated, uh, right? So, but if you go to my Google Scholar page, you can find that many of my papers they are first authors 
and they have been working on these problems. And uh, as always, thank you to NSF, DARPA, and other funding agencies. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Perez, for sharing this pretty amazing presentation with us. It is not so common to see micro robotics in actions. Thank you very much.